Tonight we have a real special guest, Ryan Sitton. And Ryan told me, I asked him uh, if Jennifer's here. He said no, but he said there are a bunch of Texas Aggies in here that know me well. And so uh, Ryan uh, is, uh, started out in Irving, Texas. He's a businessman, went uh, to Texas A&M, started a great big company that really makes sense. He is an engineer, the first engineer in the history uh, of the Railroad Commission. Uh, he has an idea about efficiency, about ratio. Uh, he understands mathematical terms uh, and inflection points that can bring to bear Texas and its assets and resources to where they will be utilized properly and well for the, for the benefit of the people of the state of Texas. Please help me welcome my railroad commissioner, Brian Sinton. I got to brag on Pete. I did not remind Pete what my wife's name was. He just walked up and said, is Jennifer here? And I, I no. And then he says, but Ryan, you're an Aggie, right? Yep. He just remembered that. You know, it's interesting how those moments stick in your mind when you connect with somebody like Pete did with me tonight. Pete, you honor me. Thank you for that. Can you think of a time in your life when something happened that changed the way you thought, that changed your perspective, changed how you think things should be done. The biggest time in recent history I can remember for me was November 6th of last year. I was at the hotel as the election results were rolling in, the Beto, Ted Cruz race, and I had helped Ted during his campaign. Some may not know when Ted was getting ready to do debate prep, they wanted to do a mock debate, and they were looking for somebody who was comfortable going after Ted, obviously tall and attractive. <laughs> so I got to debate Ted Cruz. I played the liberal socialist, and I had mastered the hand motions and how I visited with people along the border, and they want more health care. I did the whole thing. <laughs> the election night was going on, and you know, we knew it was going to be a, a, a closer race than normal. We knew that, look, to give him credit, Beto had worked hard. He'd gone over the, all over the state. Charismatic guy. As we're watching the election results come in, though, I didn't expect it to be as close as it was. And as I'm sitting there in the hotel, I'm, my mind is blown. How can, how can people buy this? This doesn't make any sense. Throughout history, we have watched socialism implode every single solitary time it's been tried. From ancient Rome, through communist Russia, through Greece and Venezuela, every single time it crashes. In fact, look at China, where they're trying to unwind it. They're trying to undo it. It never, ever, ever works. In particular, as we're hearing the news stories come in and we're hearing about the young voters and the turnout and what the young voters were saying, I'm just, my mind is blown. So I take a step back and I realize, you know, this is not about policy. We've got a brand problem. We've got a brand problem. You see, if you grew up in the 1970s and 80s like I did, you remember the Cold War. And words like communism and socialism struck fear in us. I remember sitting at home and my parents talking about what was going on in Russia and Gorbachev and Reagan going toe to toe. And I mean, it was a scary time. But if you're a high school kid today, what does socialism mean to you? I mean, social's a good thing, right? You should be social, we should be social. You don't wanna be antisocial. We've got a brand problem. In order for us to understand this brand problem, we have to think about what life was like when we were that age. I actually grew up here in Dallas County. I grew up in Irving. My parents are both teachers. My dad taught high school at Nimitz High School in Irving for 44 years. 
My mom taught at Cistercian, a little private school, for about 38 years, so they got 82 years of education between the two of them. I have a younger brother and younger sister. In fact, for the first time in my entire four-year political career, my date tonight is my brother. My brother, uh, my younger, more attractive brother, is here with me, and Zach is actually a police officer here in Dallas County. He serves at Highland Park Police Department. And Zach and Aaron and I, growing up, you know, parents both teachers, we, were, we, we didn't know extravagancy. A big evening out, oh, we're going to go to Furs Cafeteria tonight. When my mom had us, she stayed home until my brother, my young, who was the youngest, went off to school. So for about 10 years, we lived off of my dad's paycheck. My dad worked at Nimitz High School, taught North Lake College in the evenings and in the summertime, and he worked at a racetrack that my uncle owned. He worked three jobs, and we supported a family of five on probably $20,000, $25,000 a year. And we knew no different. Growing up, because my parents were both teachers, obviously I was a fantastic student which is a total lie. I, you know, you remember that kid that was awful in school? The kid that, that like always disrupted class, the kid that could never pay attention? Well, the teachers would take that kid if they didn't have to have me in their class. I was the worst kid in school, and my parents put up with it. Got all the way through school, and I really didn't know envy until I got to high school because I got to go to Cistercian where my mom taught and a lot of kids that came from, you know, Highland Park area or North Dallas area going to school there. And lo and behold, 15, 16 years old, all the other kids, you know, new Mustangs and Nissan Pathfinders are showing up. I worked two summer jobs, saved up $900, bought an 81 Camaro. But I was proud of it, man. When it came time to go to college, I wasn't a good enough student and my parents didn't have enough money for me to go to a fancy school. I didn't apply anywhere else except for Texas A&M and that other school. And luckily, I selected the finest academic institution on the planet and put myself through school. Got my mechanical engineering degree. Got out of school and went on and got my first job working in the oil business. And around the time I was 30 years old, in fact, it was about 12 years ago, the company I was working for was bought by Siemens, the big multinational company. And like that, I was out of a job. And at this point, my wife had quit work as well. So you know how you've heard of double income, no kids? We were double kids, no income. <laughs> but that's when I had the opportunity. In November of 2005, I was basically fired. Middle of 2006, we started our company, Pinnacle. We took $10,000, put it into a business account, my wife and I. For the rest of 2006, did not take a paycheck. So we went, all, went the entire year without earning an income. But that's how we started our company, Pinnacle. We had hope and we had positive energy and we knew we had a solution to the world. Today, Pinnacle employs 900 people, does business all over the world. We're very, thank you. I don't tell you that story. Now, forgive me, it sounds a little braggadocious. I don't mean it to be. I tell you that story because of a conversation my father had with me a couple of years into starting this business. I'm talking to my father about the way I grew up. And I was, I'm about 30 years old at the time, and we're talking about the risk in starting a business, what that's like, and my dad is telling me about the way I grew up. He said, you know, Ryan, you know why we didn't have money for you to go to college? No. He said, Ryan, you, you weren't a planned pregnancy. It was that day that I found out not only did my parents not plan to have me, my parents were both coming out of divorces at the time when, they got, when my mom got pregnant with me, and she had a plan. They had an appointment to have me aborted. Four days before she went in to have the abortion, my mom decides, you know what, I can't do this. She calls my dad and says, I can't do it. Jim says, okay, let's get married. They're married today, still, that, still live down in Midlothian, Texas, and even had two more kids. That, yeah. He says, you know, Ryan, why you were such a bad student? I said, no. He goes, you were severely ADD. We actually had to take you to a guidance, to a counselor, and the counselor did some tests, said, man, this kid is off the scales. You gotta put him on Ritalin. Mom and dad said, no, we're not gonna do that. Wow. I asked dad, dad, why didn't you tell me this stuff growing up? Dad says very clearly to me, son, we did not want you to be defined by your disadvantages. We want you to be defined by the possibilities. 
Man, when I was about 30 years old, that stuck with me. And about 12 years later, 14 years later, November 6, 2018, it hits me like a ton of bricks. That is what the Republican Party stands for. You see, we believe in people more than we believe in government. We believe in defining people by their possibilities and their opportunities, not by their disadvantages and their problems. This is what makes the Republican Party great. Well, why is it that kids aren't getting it? Why is that message not getting through to the next generation? You know, when you think about the things that we go through in growing up in life and the lessons that we learn, if someone had come along to me and said, Ryan, when you were a young kid in school, if somebody from the government would have forced, would have forced that school to accommodate your ADD-ness, or when you were a kid looking to get a car, you had to buy your own, what if we taxed the rich and gave you a car? Or what if we raised taxes and paid for your college education? Ryan, what if we would have promised that to you? You know what? When I was that kid, I probably would have liked that. That would have sounded pretty good. But if you came and asked me today, Ryan, if we could go back in history and do all of that stuff for you, wouldn't that have made life easier? Possibly. Would you take it? Don't you dare. You see, because of those experiences, I believe in me. I believe in people more than I believe in government. Well, Ryan, then, whose job is it? Whose job is it to look out for those of us who are in need? Whose job is it to look out for those who are at the biggest risk, who don't have what they need for life? Is, whose job is it? Oh, it's absolutely my job. I've been tremendously blessed. And it is those of us who have been the most blessed whose responsibility it is to look out or to help or to support those who are most in need. No question, unequivocally. Luke chapter 12, verse 48. Unto him much is given, of him much will be required. The thing is, it's my job as an individual. It's not the job of government. We believe in people more than we believe in government. Ryan, you only talk this way because you've been successful, some will say. Possibly. Or maybe I'm successful because I think this way. That is the message that makes the Republican Party strong. As we go out and we share our vision in 2020 for what we stand for, we talk about things like liberty. When we talk about freedom, when we talk about limited government, those things are crucial. But if you're an 18-year-old or a 22-year-old, I submit to you that you don't know what that means. But when you talk about opportunity, when you talk about where you're going, when you talk about what we do to protect opportunity, now that's something we can get excited about. In fact, let's talk about some big things today that we don't talk enough about, I think. Let's talk about some of the bold ideas that Republicans have that represent the future of our country and our state. For example, let's talk about the national debt. Right now, the federal government is in $22, $23 trillion worth of national debt. When you add in unfunded Social Security and Medicare, it's $200,000 worth of debt on every man, woman, and child in the United States. If I'm talking to an 18-year-old, do you want to be saddled with $200,000 worth of debt that paid for something you had no benefit from? No. Well, I'll tell you what, Republicans would like to balance the budget, and we'd like to get out of national debt. What about education? We believe, and Republicans, we need more choices for kids. We believe that if it's going to trade school or it's selecting a private institution, whatever suits your passion and your drive, that's what Republicans support. That's opportunity. That's possibility. We need to get away from this verbiage that every kid should go to college. Why? When more kids, when the average kid who graduates from junior college or trade school makes more than the average kid who graduates from a four year university if you take out business and engineering. We've got to begin to send a message of possibilities and opportunities that we protect. In energy, as your railroad commissioner, you heard Ryan Zinke talk about, Pete Sessions talk about it. What do we believe in energy? That it is our job to do the minimum possible so that people know that it's safe, so that we keep energy as affordable and as reliable as possible. Think about it. When gasoline prices and electricity prices are low, who benefits most? It is the poorest people in our society that benefit from those low costs. That's what we believe in. 
That's what Republicans stand for. In 2020, our mission should not simply be about us and them. It should be about carrying this bold vision that we believe in people more than we believe in government. What will I do about it? In 2020, the president will be the top of the ticket. John Cornyn will be the next statewide elected official down. Your railroad commissioner will be the third statewide elected official on the ballot. I'll be leading the state ticket. And I am not being passionate about the fact that my mission is to go out and do better than 28, in 2020 than we did in 2018 by making sure every single person we can connect with hears this message that we believe in people more than we believe in government. I'll be going out and block walking. I'll be working with your state representatives, your judges, your county commissioners, your county chairwoman to make sure that we are sending this message, especially in areas where we lost a congressman or we lost a state rep a few months ago. Because I believe that when we connect with people on that message, that's when we attract people to our cause. So when people ask you, here's what I ask of you a couple things. One, you're here already. Thank you for being here and supporting the Dallas County Republican Party. What's the role of the county party in our state mission this year? It is that when we need a ground game, when I come to Dallas to block walk with Pete Sessions or with Angie Chen Button, when I come to, to go out and connect with voters in the area, we need a ground game. It's the Dallas County party who will help us with that ground game, organize the volunteers. Your resources go in and support Missy to do that so we can be really effective in the local apparatus. Here's the second thing. Please help me repeat this message. When people talk to you, especially young people, about what the Republican Party believes in, we believe in leadership, we believe in service, and we believe in perseverance. We believe in opportunity and accountability, which comes out of the possibilities. We believe in protecting opportunity for every single Texan, especially those who are most in need, but we do not believe in doing it by taking something from somebody to give it to somebody else. What we believe in is keeping what we do as small as possible and letting individuals take care of the rest because we believe in people more than we believe in government. Thank you very much for having me this evening. It's a pleasure to serve you as your railroad commissioner. God bless you.